Welcome to a complete history of Manchester United. A complete history, not the complete history. We don't claim to be the definitive resource for it. It's just our version, our walk down Manchester United history. Um, I'm Wayne Barton, author and producer of Manchester United Books and Films, and joined by the legendary Paddy Barkley, um, legendary journalist and football writer, former journalist, of course. Uh, we'll be yeah. taking you on this journey through Old Trafford history. If you're watching the video, please give it a like and subscribe. Join in the conversation in the comment section. If you're listening to the audio podcast, please do be sure to subscribe on that network and give us a review on the platform you're listening on. Uh, in the last episode, Paddy, we looked at the 1948 uh, team and how they won the FA Cup. Today we're looking at 48-49, but before we get to that, uh, Matt Busby would spend um, some time in April celebrating at Wembley, was um, back at the old National Stadium over the summer. Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, it was uh, it was a summer job for him. He was engaged by uh, his old friend Sir Stanley Rouse um, to um, to look after the Great Britain Olympic team. Uh, you may recall we spoke before about how uh, Sir Stanley, whose influence and friendship with Sir Matt was, was, was profound, and we'll get on to the wider effects of that uh, in Europe later. But um, he, 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 Sir Stanley had, or, or the then Stanley Rouse, had marked Matt out as a leader and uh, hence, he was the manager of, a, of an all-star football team that entertained the troops during the Second World War. Now, he's uh, appointed Great Britain manager. The 26 amateur players picked for the GB squad were picked by a, uh, a committee. But Matt was, had complete control over them in terms of coaching, uh, which was by then not a given uh, for managers. But uh, yes, he did, and he did okay. They won uh, a couple of matches before running into um, the uh, the semi into trouble in the semi-finals against the Yugoslav team, which Matt uh, forecast would uh, be a, a, a product of what was then called shamateurism, in other words, amateurs, but who were paid enough expenses to train as professionals the yuga this was the yugoslav team croatia serbia all in one at that time um as well as the other other yugoslav countries and uh, sure enough whether through shamateurism or sheer talent they prevailed over great britain in the semi-finals and that was matt able to concentrate on manchester united yet again the team had uh, most of the of the squad had had a a nice tour of, of Ireland, um, where the the breaks were off or the constraints were off. Matt allowed them to eat what they want and to have a, a few Guinnesses anytime they anytime that was um, sensible after a match, and it was great fun. Um, so it was a good sort of relaxation for the players, and uh, I'm afraid belied attention. Uh, between the, the squad and Matt over over money. Yeah. Um, Matt obviously had a lot of confidence in his squad. Um, they, they'd already built at United. Um, no new players brought in for the start of this campaign. None signed. No new ones even brought into the squad, really. And by and large, the team was now the same ever present, uh, except for two key positions throughout the season. John Anderson deputised mostly for Billy McGlynn sharing the off-back position, and, and we'll get on to a story about Johnny Morris, which is quite interesting. Um, wow. on, yeah. on that One subject, of the most dramatic episodes, yes. <laughs> on that subject, um, as should now be evident throughout this series, we will be looking at the new players as and when they're introduced into the first team. It's not only the first team we'll be in, uh, in concentrating on, but obviously for the introduction of that player and a description of that player in greater detail, you'd have to go to the episode where they're introducing to the team. Um, so for that feeling of continuity, let's take a little peek behind the curtain for a little minute, just to look at the setup of the club um, as it's been ticking along. You'll see here, um, Sir Matt Busby, Matt Busby then, um, Bert Wally and Jimmy Murphy uh, flanking him. Matt smiling very kindly at, at Jimmy there. Perhaps Jimmy's just giving him a few 
prospects um, of, of what's to come in the future. Um, Jimmy at that time being ably assisted by Bert in the um, second string. Jimmy had sort of like the control of everything beyond the first team. So that was the reserve team, the A and B team. Um, the youth team not yet to come into fruition, but we'll come to that in, in further episodes. Um, although, the, I mean, the youth team was effectively the team that played in the B-side. Um, they had training on Tuesday and Thursday nights with young prospects, local lads coming to the area. They were helped by Jack Pauline, Arthur, pa Arthur Powell, Bert Fishbone, Harry Hablet, Joe Travis. These were the coaches who looked after the various teams. Um, Jimmy generally would cast out of the young players and look after the reserve sides. Uh, the reserve side, for now, was still populated with the likes of the fringe players like your Cassidy, Burke, Buckle, Warner, L Lowry, the players that were mentioned in the, the previous episode. Um, and the players, uh, Paddy, they were being brought to United by um, Louis Rocker, of course, but he was um, joined now in prominence by a little fella by the name of Joe Armstrong. Yeah, a little, a little fellow with a big influence on the uh, course of Manchester United's history. Joe Armstrong had been uh, working with a, with a little twinkling Mancunian um, of the kind that I found lots of when I first went to Manchester in the, the late 60s and early 70s. There were a lot of these warm, uh, astute, men around the football clubs and 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 joe armstrong was a perfect example of that very charming uh, as you had to be um in in the final stages of the scouting process wonderful judge of a player matt went back a long way with him he remembered him from manchester city for which for whom joe uh, armstrong worked for for quite some time and always had him marked out as someone who he would like to get to Manchester United. However, there was, of course, the legend uh, of Louis Rocca, who had been uh, identifying, recruiting, uh, promising players for Manchester uh, and, and indeed signing them for Manchester United for many years, but Louis Rocca wasn't getting any younger. And besides, um, uh, the, a, a year earlier, as, as Jimmy Murphy had warned Matt that the quality of players coming through from this Manchester and district first policy was not good enough to maintain the standards that United had already set and aspired to in the future. Therefore, <clears throat> um, they would have to cast the net wider and, and Matt felt that Joe Armstrong was the ideal person to do this. So there was a sort of overlap between Louis Rocca and uh, Joe Armstrong, but Joe by now in this season 1948-9 was already at work with Manchester United and um, the transition was underway. Yeah, um, it's one of those situations where if a local schoolmaster saw a player we thought would good would be good, um, Joe would yeah. be tipped off invariably and then he'd go travelling all over the country to see these players. He'd go yeah. north, south, he'd literally go everywhere. To, he'd be the first, generally the first United representative um, laying eyes on a, on a player. Uh, we'll talk about the regional scouts as well as this series goes on. Um, the likes of Jack O'Brien, Reg Priest, these kind of guys. The work was also being done locally to find suitable people in the area. Joe Armstrong again doing that, really tireless behind the scenes. Uh, the people in the area would serve as landlords and landladies to house these young players when they'd be coming in from out of town. Uh, but yeah, for, for now, the reserve team still populated with the likes of these players that were quite good, but not obviously of the first team standard they come in and deputize but as jimmy had already sort of identified to mark that um wouldn't be great to sort of dislodge the players in the in the first team uh, mm -hmm. so it, we go into a season then um we remember that there was a pay dispute in the previous summer um this mm -hmm. was a similar um, story this time around with johnny morris the most notable unhappy player um, this situation would drag on for a little while it'd have to be resolved later into the season but the upshot was, Paddy, more or less, that the players were demanding more money. And Busby was insisting that the club perks, such as the free cinema tickets, the trips to Blackpool, that these were sufficient. He was actually trying to build the prestige of Manchester United and playing for Manchester United. Mm. But while the eyes of the country were dazzled by what they had already seen, internally, mm. these players who were setting that standard felt that they were deserving a little more for what they'd done. Yes, absolutely. And they, they came up with all sorts of plans to do it, um, as as um, as you know, there, there was already a tradition of 
golf, the Davy Hume golf club days and so on. Um, and uh, the somebody in the squad came up with an idea that they could be given expensive sets of golf cl golf clubs, um, you know, worth a lot of money, and that these could be put down as training equipment. And Matt did think about this, went to Harold Hardman, the chairman, uh, who was the chairman by now. Um, and uh, they did think it over because it was kind of marginal. After all, the cinema tickets probably were perks, but they were kind of uh, small perks and, and, and the golf clubs would have been big ones. So um, the, eventually Hardman and Busby decided on purist, purist um, no, we won't break the league regulations either in letter or spirit. And of course the players, you know, were furious about this because they said, well, every other club does, you know, we mentioned Derby County in the last episode and the gold watches which uh, they claim to have been given uh, three years earlier as a prize for winning the FA Cup. I mean, gold watch is probably worth even more than, than a set of top-of-the-range golf clubs. So um, they, they said, well, every other club's doing it. Why can't we? And, and, and Matt said, no. Furthermore, there was the issue, which is probably not unique to United, but um, the bonuses for winning the FA Cup the previous season <clears throat> the players received 20 quid each for winning the FA Cup, which would have been all right if they had. Now, whether they they found out that Matt got 1,750, I don't know. But just suppose somebody had leaked that information. Um, it's a kind of a, a bigger differential uh, than you would get uh, between, say, Pep Guardiola and... Um, Kevin De Bruyne at Manchester City today, so it it it, it was. Uh, I mean, Matt was Matt was doing very nicely, thank you, better than the players, and 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 the, there probably was a feeling that there was too big a disparity um, there. Uh, I mean, to put it in context, Matt could be paid whatever United wanted under the regulations, but the players couldn't. So. It, they, they were different times, and 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 to, to portray Matt as a as a sort of uh, you know an abuser of his own power would be going much much too far. But uh, it, it, uh, it there were there were definite tensions over over pay all the time, and um, they became evident uh, as soon as the season began, because there yeah. was a well, in fact, before the season began, there was a threat of a of a training strike. They didn't threat threatened not to play in the opening match at home to Derby, of all people. Derby probably wearing their gold watches as they ran out, just to be cheeky. But um, no, uh, in the build-up to that game in the pre-season, um, they did threaten to go on a training st strike. And although they were persuaded out of that by Matt, using the old arguments about, you know, the glory and, and, and if you play the, to the standard you can, the, the glory and the money will come and blah, blah, blah. Um, despite that, the fact they lost that match against Derby, um, disappointing the opening day crowd. So um, they looked as if they'd been on a training strike by all accounts of, of that match. Yeah, um, yeah. Derby won two one on the opening day of the season. I'm just yep. going to pop up the, um, the tactics graphic uh, with the cup final team. Um, here you'll see it was generally this team, um, Anderson sort of coming in and out, but we'll talk about the, the squad in a, in a little while. Mm. Um, but perhaps we could... that, uh, to, to look that uh, but Coburn there, Henry Coburn, he along with two others, uh, Stan Pearson and um, and uh, John, John Aston, uh, had been away. I had actually missed the Ireland tour because they'd been away with England, and to have three players in uh, in an England squad was quite unusual for a club in those days. Further evidence of United's growing prestige. Yeah, um, yeah, and then, and then the season started as, as you mentioned. They lost two one at home to Derby on yeah. the opening day. Um, lost at home, which was still main road to Blackpool after being three two up in the 80th minute, and they lost at injury time. It was, it was a really poor run for the first 15 games. It was five league defeats. They also lost the charity shield against the league champions Arsenal, 
that was yeah. a, again by 4-3 at Highbury in October. And in, in these days, the Charity Shield was played in early October and it, it was a mid-season oh. game. Take it a little bit more seriously in terms of competition, if not quite by the rules, as we'll discover in later episodes. Um, but then United did have a bit of a turnaround. They won 6-1 at Preston. And that was a, the start of a 17-game unbeaten run, Paddy. In the middle of yeah. this one, they win 4-1 at Middlesbrough. I'll just pop up here because uh, Rowley scored a hat-trick in this game. They got some mm. great press from this um, incredible result. But trouble was uh, brewing, uh, Paddy. And, and in the middle of the yeah. season, Matt Busby, I think it, it's fair to say that, I mean, he made a couple of big statements in what he was doing with the team. But um, the first major statement in, in regards to the playing staff Came yeah. when this this Morris uh, this this dispute with Johnny Morris basically came to a head. Yeah, well, he never really got on with Johnny Morris. We talked about Johnny Morris in previous episodes. Fantastically talented footballer. You remember the the incident in the cup final where he uh, he, he pushed a teammate out of the way and hit a free kick that was so beautifully flighted and so accurate that it just needed a nod into the net and it part of the turning of the game. Uh, against Blackpool, he, he was, you know, a, a big occasion, big player, um, and uh, he, he was more than a talent. He was a tough tackler. Uh, Jimmy Murphy would have enjoyed that aspect of his game. He had the lot, except his personality clashed with the managers. There was there was a quote from Busby, um, who was said to have told one another of the players. Um, and the, the other player remains anonymous, but he, he said that Busby had told him, I've tried every angle, I've bullied him, I've used flattery, I've tried every way, but I just can't get through to him. And sure enough, Morris seems to have enjoyed winding Matt up a bit, because on Tuesday training, I'll tell you a story about Tuesday training, was was quite important, because if they... If uh, if they if they'd won, it, you know, it would be it would be going through the things they got right. If they'd lost, it'd be going things through the things they got wrong. On one Tuesday, the previous weekend, they'd conceded uh, a goal direct from a free kick. I can't remember which game it was, but um, basically, um, Busby said, "Right, we need a more solid defensive wall if we're not going to concede." from free kicks, we need five men instead of four and uh, in the wall. And uh, Morris disagreed. Uh, he said, he, he, Busby said, you know, everything's working. Uh, you can go for lunch now. And Morris uh, disagreed. He said, you know, five men's not going to make any difference. You can still beat five men. So Busby said, okay, Johnny, if you think it you do it so they lined up with five men again and john morris of course uh chipped it in the, into the net leaving the goalkeeper helpless thereby <laughs> destroying busby's theory um and okay busby let that one go uh but a much more serious uh, challenge to busby's authority occurred when morris lost his place it wasn't the first time he'd had injury problems during the season during that poor run that you mentioned and uh, basically Morris when he was dropped again he claimed he was fit and protested um, Busby made it equally clear, clear I picked the team and uh, Morris responded by going I suppose on a on a on a training strike a one-man training strike because um, he just wasn't putting in a shift in training and uh, Busby pulled him aside during a session and, and said, you know, why are you behaving like this? And he said, well, what's the point of training if I'm going to be playing in the reserves? You know, do I need to train? I can, I can do that without training. And uh, he made this point. And before Busby could reply, he just started walking towards the changing room. And Busby yelled after him. He said, if you don't come back, You'll never play for this team again. And he kept walking. But he thought that, I think Morris must have felt that this was just another row. And, um, but Busby's mind was made up. He didn't run after him and rant and rave or 
grab him by the throat or anything like that. I wouldn't be Busby. Busby just completed the training session, went to his office, picked up the telephone, and the National News Agency, the Press Association, which feeds all newspapers, it still does, feeds all newspapers. It's a sort of uh, basic news service that goes everywhere. Yeah. And knowing this, uh, Busby rang up the football man at, on the desk at the Press Association. And anyway, half an hour, an hour, an hour that same afternoon, Morris was at home thinking, well, I wonder what Busby is going to do about this. When uh, a reporter from the Press Association uh, said, Johnny, I, what's your reaction to the news? He says, what news? He says, the fact that you'd be put on the transfer list. Uh, he says, what? He says, well, uh, Matt Busby's told me, told us that you're you're on the transfer list. You're open to, you're available. You're, you're not going to play for Manchester United anymore. And that was how he found out that, you know, despite Matt's gentle demeanor, um, you know, as I said in my, in my book, you know, for Matt, a threat and a promise were the same thing. And uh, that was it. Morris was out. One of his best players. Yeah. That was it. Um, and that was a signal, I think, to the rest of the team. But it was also but Matt following his principles that, yes, we'll be a happy family, but we'll be a happy family on my terms. And if anybody disrupts it, that's it. The highway. Yeah. So Morris was out. A uh, big fee to Derby County who came in for him. Yeah, uh, Liverpool actually bid the first... United transfer listed him at 25,000, which would have been a world record, but even... He would have brought, smashed the world record, but even then, um, he didn't fancy Liverpool. Maybe he always fancied Derby. Maybe there'd been some talk in the background. There's good evidence that there was. Uh, Derby offered, I think, more like... Uh, 24 and a half, just under the 25. And uh, Busby accepted that. It was a world record fee. The world record at that time was 23,000, um, which had been paid by River Plate of Buenos Aires for uh, Bernabe Ferreira, an incredible goal scorer, uh, still a legend to this day uh, at, in Argentine football. And uh, so that was, uh, that, was, uh, that was the end of... End of Johnny Morris and Manchester United. Yeah, one of the um, famous five. And the, some of that money quickly reinvested, Paddy. Yeah, uh, he actually, it had been, re it was obvious that, that the transfer was going to go through. So um, Matt, um, rather cleverly, uh, you usually get a player a little bit cheaper if you, if, you, if you buy before you sell. I think that was probably Matt's intention when he signed John. Downey, a quick and clever Scottish player who had been very impressive during um, United's. They had a three game marathon with Bradford Park Avenue of the second division uh, in the cup before finally getting through. And Downey had really impressed in those, in those, in that sort of three great game series. Uh, so Johnny Downey was now with Manchester United as the replacement for uh, for Johnny Morris. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Morris is playing, uh, placing the forward line, taken by Downey. Also, John Anderson, because Downey was cup tied for the cup, so Anderson would move around and McGlenn move back into half by position. Um, Paddy mentioned the FA Cup run. It took them all the way to the semi-final, uh, included wins of 6-0, 5-0 and 8-0 against Yeovil in which Jack Rowley netted five times. The semi-final was against Wolves. Uh, they got into the, it went to a replay at Goodison Park, uh, but Wolves won in the dying moments. In front of 73,000 there, um, United recovered from that setback to win the last four league games. Um, the last game was a 3-2 home win over Champions Portsmouth. Obviously, I think mentioned earlier, but they're still playing at Main Road at this point. Um, the 3-2 win over... Um, Portsmouth secured second place on goal average. So that's three seasons in a row. They finished um, in third place, uh, second place. So let's just have a run through the squad statistics, uh, Paddy. This is yeah. my moment where I jump in and give the numbers to the to the readers, uh, to the viewers and listeners. 
Um, there, I'll put up a squad picture so you can see see the players as I'm doing this. Jack Crompton in the back line, still still pretty short for a goalkeeper, isn't he? There, but yeah, so yeah, yeah, but. Especially with Big Chilton next to him, yeah. <laughs> uh, 41 appearances in the league, so um, recovered from those earlier injury problems to be the, the dominant uh, player. 50 appearances in all competitions. Barry Brown had one step-in performance for him. Uh, John Aston Senior, 39 appearances, uh, left back, um, 48 in all competitions. John Ball occasionally stepping in for him and Johnny Carey. Um, but Johnny Carey made 41 appearances on will Just have a quick word about Johnny Carey, um, Paddy, because he was um, named as the footballer, um, football writers, footballer of the year. And this was the first season where, where well, so second season after Stanley Matthews, wasn't it, who won it the previous year. Um, yeah. So, so it was a great season for Carey, and obviously a lot of that coming off the back of the successful cup run the previous year as well. Yeah, I think to get to the, the to get it once again to the last four of the cup. Although we mentioned during the year United won the cup, they they had you know really tough draws in every single game. But um, this season, really after beating Bradford, Yeovil, and someone else whose name escapes me, um, quite easy, relatively easy progress. Uh, they then lost to the first real top team they met, which was Wolves. So. Uh, but even so, the record books will always show FA Cup semi-finalists, league runners-up and footballer of the year for Johnny Carey. So another successful season for Manchester United um, by by the standards that the cr- club had suddenly uh, become accustomed to, um, you know, almost as soon as Busby got down to work, yeah, after the war. So Carey, 30 years old, wins the um, the second ever award of the first Manchester United player to win it. Just go through some of the other players. Uh, Tommy Lowry coming in and uh, filling in at fullback as well when he was needed. Alan B. Chilton, ever present, um, 42 in, 42 appearances in the league, 51 appearances in all competitions. Mm. Henry Coburn, 36 appearances in the league, 44 in all competitions. Billy McGlynn scored a single goal. Um, made 23 appearances in the league and 31 in all appearances as he was sort of flitting in and out of the side. Mm-hmm. John Anderson uh, making 17 appearances, not scoring a goal. Jack Warner in the halfback line making four appearances. And then the forward line, um, Ted Buckle, Ronnie Burke, Laurie Cassidy, these guys are on the periphery again. Ted Buckle mm-hmm. scored two goals in seven games. Ronnie Burke, 13 goals in 16 games to step in yeah. after. Yeah, but but um, despite that, 13 goals in 16 games for Big Ronnie Burke. Uh, and yet he was transferred. Um, and must be raising another £16,000 uh, by selling him to Huddersfield. Because yeah. although he scored goals, he was big and strong, but he wasn't he wasn't the, of the class that must be demanded. The incredible goal-scoring record, though. 13 yeah. goals in, in 16. I, I mean, you, you can't do much better than that, can you? No. Uh, Laurie Cassidy, single appearance. Um, and Jimmy Delaney, we haven't shown him before on screen, and so he definitely deserves um, his due sort of um, exposure here. Um, he scored four goals in 43 appearances, uh, and um, 36 of those appearances were in the league. John Downey, after he arrived at the club, he scored five goals in 12 league appearances. And then the forward line, Charlie Morris, uh, Charlie Mitten, sorry, he, he played. 51 appearances in all competitions and 23 goals, uh, 42 in the league, 18 goals. Johnny Morris, before he left, six goals in 23 games in all competitions. All of those goals were in the league. And uh, Stan Pearson, 17 goals in 47 um, games in all competitions, 14 goals in the league. Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, the top scorer for Another year in succession was Jack Rowley. 30 yeah. goals um, in all competitions. 20 of those were in the league. Um, while I'm, I'm just finishing on the squad, I want to pop up, um, as Paddy was talking earlier about the finances, I just want to pop up a finance sheet there for you to have a look. Uh, you can see that most of the players are on 10 pounds um then there's some at 14 pounds some at 15 pound and i think somewhere on there you can see johnny morris and the um note that he'd been transferred to derby midway through <laughs> the season so yeah, yeah. Um, that's how the finances sheets um i'll, I'll look at that time um 
the tactics again, position by position, uh, the run was basically the same. Anderson and McLean. I mean, we see Morris. That's where um, Dan would have come yeah. in at that point. Um, and Downey obviously uh, taking over Morris's position in the number number eight shirt. Um, mm. The United review was the same with the handshake at the mm. top, and the colours were, were once again um, the the kit colours were red, white, and black for the home kit. And for the blue, a little bit of a change: blue shirt, white socks, and blue socks. Uh, sorry, white shorts and blue socks instead of black socks. Mm. Um, the key results. I mean, the key results over the season. The the, the Yeovil 8 0 was a standout result. The 6 1 at Preston, who were eventually relegated, was a big one. The 4 1 at, at Middlesbrough, as we mentioned earlier, got a lot of um, praise in the press for the way that way that they played. Um, and, and Paddy, uh, really, I mean, Busby's work had been noted throughout the country. Um, mm. Mm. They, they were looking at this um, sort of idea that he'd, he'd finished second again and he'd won the cup and not retained the cup. So maybe he was wanting, uh, well, there was one club in particular, Paddy, who thought that he might be tempted by a move elsewhere. Yes, I mean, uh, Tottenham made uh, a huge offer of £2,750 a year um, to, to Busby, um, but he said no, uh, because, well, apart from anything else, uh, his salary after the FA Cup win uh, less than a year earlier had been put up to 3,250 or 500 pounds more. Um, so he was, given that the players weren't even earning a thousand a year, including bonuses, um, you know, that's that gives you an idea of, of how well he was thought of and how well he was remunerated. Um, uh, Tottenham, by the way, went uh, to a, a, fr a friend of Busby's, Arthur Rowe, uh, instead, after Busby had turned them down, and they they engaged Arthur Rowe, who'd been Busby's assistant with the All Star Army Services team that had toured um, uh, during the war. Uh, Arthur Rowe didn't do a bad old job with Tottenham. Um, well, there was another uh, managerial appointment, by the way, around that time. Carlisle of the Third Division North. Um, very humble club at uh, that time, uh, appointed somebody called Bill Shankly as manager. I wonder what happened to him. Um, uh, elsewhere, what? Uh, Portsmouth, as we said, they won the league. Uh, Wolves under Stan Cullis um, with Captain Billy Wright, United's conquerors in the semi-final, obviously. They, they won the FA Cup. Busby, having rejected Spurs, uh, remained focused at the task in, and, uh, Man in Manchester. Uh, three runners-up places on the trot. He was seeing these men who had missed the early 20s of their years, really, um, and their career. Thanks to the um, war, they were now creeping up to 30 and over, and he knew that he would have to gradually make these changes, more changes like the one that he'd made with Morris. He was, however, hoping that this team would have one great success left in them. Um, so we'll be talking about that in future episodes. And before we go on to that, if you don't mind, I've got some breaking news for you. <laughs> um, and everybody listening, I've just the Evening Chronicles just come in, and there's a piece by Alf Clark here in the Manchester <laughs> Evening Chronicle, uh, and it's great news for all Man United fans. Old Trafford will be open again next season. That's season forty nine fifty. Uh, next season it will be open with an initial capacity of fifty thousand after the war damage. And uh, the main stand is going to be rebuilt. It's going to hold 3,000 people. Wow. And there's further cover for 15,500. So cover for nearly 20,000 out of uh, 50,000. That should be just about enough uh, to hold United's average gate. So fantastic news that uh, football's coming home. Fantastic. Uh, contemporary breaking news. The only place you can get that on a history. <laughs> I love it. Um, if you're watching the video, please give it a like and subscribe. And as I said earlier, join in the conversation in the comment section. If you're listening to the audio podcast, please be sure to subscribe and give us a review on the platform you're listening on. Thanks for watching.